again, I'm very privileged to have an excellent panel with me, and I'm very privileged because most of them are actually here physically present on stage. So please do uh, do join us on stage. I have uh, Kilian Gross, who's head of unit for artificial intelligence policy development and coordination at the European Commission. Kilian, please. Okay, I should probably stand up and just, there you go. <laughs> then we have Axel Voss, member of the European Parliament. Welcome. Uh, who's next? Sorel Messine, head of marketing for Ivy Tech. Sorel, welcome. Uh, Istvan Batak, founder and CEO on Compass Medicine. I'm blocking, this was not rehearsed very efficiently. <laughs> And then joining us uh, online, we have Farzad Saber, uh, Chief Product Officer Hello. at nice O2Matic. Thank you. Great to meet you. Adam. Okay. Good introduction. You can all sit, please. <laughs> Thank you. I'll sit first <coughs> so the message is clear. Um, so AI Act, the first big piece of uh, legislative policymaking that the new European Commission put on the table, big one huge impact on everybody. And as Cecilia was saying, just like GDPR, it's gonna be pretty much transversal, transversal, right? Everybody is gonna have to comply uh, in some, some way or another. Um, so what we wanna discuss on this panel is specifically what impact the proposal will have on innovation, particularly when it comes to the smaller uh, players that we wanna grow uh, in Europe, and which I understand is also the underlying objective of having AI regulation in the first place, which is more legal certainty, allowing for a, a, a level playing field that also benefits um, smaller players. So, of course, Killian, you know, uh, noblesse oblige, you're gonna have to go first. Um, and the commission has thought specifically about the issue of what happens to smaller players. And there are specific provisions about uh, facilitating, supporting uh, AI innovation and compliance for smaller companies. Um, when you look at these provisions now that we've had, you know, uh, a few months between the proposal and, and what's happened uh, in, in council and parliament uh, on the proposal, uh, how satisfied are you with, with those measures? Maybe you can explain a bit also what those are for, for our audience. Um, and do you think, you know, based on, on what you've heard from stakeholders so far, that you know, even more than you've proposed could be, uh, could be in the final legislation once we have it? <coughs> Thanks a lot. It's most kind that I can be here and we can, of course, speak about my favorite topic, the AI Act, so that's fantastic. Um, and it's really nice to, to see you all in person again. I still have to say this because after so many virtual meetings where we go over on small screens, it's a pleasure. Uh, <coughs> indeed, when we started the, the discussion on the AI Act, we really had in mind to find this balance between having a regulatory framework where AI is trustworthy on the one hand side and keeping, but still leaving enough room for innovation, not to kill innovation because we see a lot of benefits for AI. And we just came out of the COVID crisis and without AI, we would not probably not all be here now in this room uh, mm -hmm. sitting safely. So we need to find this, this good balance. And I think the key thing for all undertakings, not only as SMEs, is of course to have a good and a clear regulation. That was the first, the first objective. Because what we got as a feedback from the public consultation was mainly if there is a need for new regulation, then it must be clear and precise. So not to have too many vague obligations like asking you uh, assess yourself the risk, uh, do a risk assessment, what you think, how high risk you are, and what you then have to take for measures to hedge the risk, because that would lead to a lot of complexity, particularly for small undertakings with, not, with no uh, specialized law department. So I think that's the first big thing we have. We have, I, I think, a rather clear-cut proposal where you don't need to be a legal expert to identify whether your system is AI and whether it's high risk, and therefore you have to do certain requirements which are spelled out in the law and will be translated by, by standards. So I think that is really uh, is the first key thing for, um, for all undertakings. Then on top of this, we tried <coughs> really to think about what do SMEs need, what is really necessary for them, and what we put into the regulation in the proposal, I have to say, because now it's in the hand, uh, not of God, but of the co-legislators, <laughs> uh, <coughs> is um, that we... we we put in a whole article and a whole chapter on, on innovation and support. We introduced regulatory sandboxes, which I think are very important because they will provide for a kind of protected space where SMEs, startups can think and develop their systems and then bring them uh, to a conformity assessment. 
there should be a priority access for, for starters and SMEs for these systems. They should have re reduced fees for the um, ex ante conformity assessment if it need be, and there should be a, a training and information campaign to help them to find access and um, to find the necessary info which, which are required. Now, there's of course the major question in town is, is this enough? Do you need more? Can you think of more? Um, of course, now we are um, in the middle of the discussion, so I can just voice what has been raised. You could think of, do we need derogations for SMEs, for startups? Should they be exempted from certain obligations? That's certainly one thing which is discussed, if you ask me. We have not done so in the original proposal because we felt we are just dealing with high risk. And high risk can occur notwithstanding the source uh, of the, or the origin of a given AI system. And in particular, in the virtual world, even a small company can have a very big reach out with an AI system which is taken up by a lot. But this is certainly something you can, you can discuss, whether you need um, a, a real derogation for a given period of time, uh, for some of the obligations, for instance, um, or um, a field testing. So there are some ideas which are circulated. But I think that's, for me, the good thing, the key principle that we need um, a special chapter on innovation and startups, and that we need to really think this as well from the perspective of startups is very important and is uh, not contested, I think. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, thank you, Killian. Um, we are, again, very lucky because we have three um, SMEs uh, from our National Trade Associations on, on, on this panel. Um, uh, we have Sorel from Ivy Tech from Estonia. Okay. Um, and Ivy Tech uses AI algorithms to map geospatial data for the purposes of road infrastructure management, which mm. is a very a very interesting use case uh, where Europe is one of the leading geographies already in the world. Uh, and you have big, big plans for international expansion. Um, can you maybe explain for our audience how you're using AI, what the benefits for the use case that your company does are? Yeah, AI is crucial for us because we basically use AI to make everything faster. Uh, we do data digitalizing and data processing. And of course, AI does it hundreds of times faster than a uh, human being. It does it more cost effectively because let's say we would like to digitalize um, 1 million kilometers, we would need 10,000 human beings to do that. But actually, AI is going to do it in a few hours and it's going to do it in a very automated way. And uh, there is no way for the AI to get tired. And also because we train the algorithm all the time, so it gets more and more efficient and more and more capacity. Actually, as a former translator for years, before getting into AI, uh, even though I was speaking 10 languages, but I was still afraid of AI because a document that Google Translate could uh, uh, translate in three seconds with a copy paste, I needed as a human being weeks to be able to translate it. But Google Translate does it just like that. And I was like, OK, I think with AI, I'm going to lose my job very soon. So I need to, or I get into AI, I need to surrender somehow. Or I get into AI, or I lose my job. So I think AI is really very important. And in the road infrastructure, AI is very important because it predicts which the human beings done. Because, for example, talking about data capturing in general, you're trying to detect all the road defects out there. And the AI can see even on the ground what the human being cannot see. So um, I think AI is just like the, our little god for now. We need to trust it more, and we need to, to be more open. And of course, uh, we're trying to. Uh, promote more, the more reliable uh, cyberspaces as possible, and also uh, the safest ones, of course. Very good. So having heard from our first SME, I'm probably going to bring up the uh, poll question. It wouldn't be a digital Europe panel if there wasn't a poll question. Uh, the question for this session is, will the AI Act, as it is currently written, support SMEs to innovate, or will it make it more difficult? Let's see how nuanced the percentages will be there. Um, 
And Killian mentioned already that, you know, the commission has put forward its proposal. You can uh, think whether or not it can be improved. And, of course, we have Axel Voss, who's in the business, being uh, an MEP, of improving <laughs> what comes out of the commission. You're one of the most uh, passionate and prolific uh, authors uh, in the European Parliament. Um, and in among the many amendments that you uh, put forward, uh, both in your uh, draft report for the URI committee, but also in the other uh, many committees, uh, the lead committee as well, notably, uh, where you have been uh, a leading figure. Um, you have put forward, uh, among other things, measures to support uh, uh, businesses uh, in addition to what was already in the proposal. So can you explain to us what your main concerns are, what your main proposals are? So, um, thanks a lot for the invitation and having also this exchange of views here. So, my, my main concern is that we are ending up with a GDPR 2.0 regarding AI. Um, so, that's why I think we need to approach these from a more strategical um, angle, so that we are with the meaning of AI and s having in mind AI is the booster of digitalization. And um, everyone who is leading in AI might lead the world, that we, there is a necessity for the European Union also to be a leader in something, whatever it is at the end, but I think we need to um, step forward. And this is what I'm asking then myself, can we create here something what is really supporting developing, inventing AI, and not sticking to the old stereotype behavior, what we are always having in the European Parliament, is uh, thinking of protection of everything, but not coming with this idea and saying, oh, we need to improve the situation for our own, or in the interest of our own business. And, um, and this is, in, in general speaking, the thinking how we would like to approach it. And uh, therefore, I'm always um, in, the, in, in favor of uh, saying, please concentrate only on high-risk AI systems and nothing else. And then we are coming to this definition thing, uh, so that normal AI or, or not learning AI systems uh, shouldn't be a kind of in, in the scope at all because there's nothing intelligent if you have one algorithm doing always the same and not learning. And uh, the second step then would be we need these only autonomous um, systems and then concentrating how also we can support this inventing because we created with the GDPR already a mentality in saying do not process data, personal data in this case, but this is the mentality. And now we, we, we have to find a way we coming, we are coming with a wish list of ethical aspects of these and, w and, and this is totally a good idea in, in connecting values and uh, fundamental rights with technique. This is a niche of, for Europe and to provide the world with something what might be a kind of a better good at the end. But if we are not doing this right, we are out of the business. And, um, and, and here we are coming to then to a situation where we are coming with this in and saying so AI should be non-discriminatory, should be gender balanced, should be not, not biased. And if we are not providing then the quality data for it, then I do not know how to achieve these goals at the end. So um, therefore what, what Killian already said is sandboxes are necessary probably to solve this problem. And um, therefore, this, this should be part in everyone thinking, also <laughs> in the European Parliament or in the Council. But I'm confronted more and more the approach of other um, political parties in the Parliament that they are coming now from a consumer protection idea. But this won't fit totally um, the, let's say, product regulation at the end. 
So, and, and this is, uh, I'm, I'm very much concerned about this um, development and at the end we need a kind of a strong commission and a strong and self-confident council in saying what the parliament probably might do um, is totally going against our overall interest in, in um, coming forward as a European uh, industry. And, um, and then they have to very strict in, in limiting everything. What might the parliament um, come with some ideas on only this protection level? And uh, so far, it's not, um, we, we are not ready yet. Uh, we, we are starting and discussing. But um, if we are losing these, I would say we are totally out of digital developments. So we, we lost already these um, personal data and, and social um, um, media issues. But if we are now losing this one also, I do not see how we might catch up in the future. So this is our step or might be our step forward to catch up in some of um, yeah, sectors and wha whatever it is, but we need to come forward. Thank you so much, Axel. <coughs> um, I'm going to go to Farzad, who joins us remotely from uh, Automatic in uh, Denmark. Um, the, the, the Axel's uh, first uh, uh, reply to my question must have sounded very ominous to you, uh, <laughs> in the sense that you have a day job and you you are in this panel also because you must have done some some thinking, initial thinking at least, about what the AI Act could potentially mean for you when it comes to complying with it. Uh, O2Matic is a, in the medtech space, uh, and it uh, uses AI to optimize oxygen supply for patients. Um, so I'm going to ask you a similar question to Sorel, so more or less to explain to our audience what the benefits of using AI for this particular use case would be. Um, and also, again, initial reflection on, on what you think the impact on O2Matic could be. Um, when it comes to at least you know some of the ob ob obligations we can mention, for example, you know human oversight in your specific uh, use case, how would that look like? Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, Alberto, and thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, I mean, automatic. Uh, it's been used to treat patients automatically at hospitals. As you know, in the last election, it has always been a, a challenge. We've been talking about how to. Um, there is an echo in the connection. Is it correct? Yes, we can hear you just and, fine. Okay. Yeah, and the, you know, the last elections we have been talking about the healthcare and the challenges with having enough doctors and nurses at hospitals. By using AI, we are trying to reduce the need for spending time on the manual processes like control and the treating patients. And uh, because of the lack of doctors and nurses at hospitals, AI is a very important part of uh, using the technology and solve some of the challenges we have within the healthcare sector. And by having the, these acts uh, limitations, it might be difficult for companies, SMEs, to keep working with AI as a technology. And that's why I'm just asking we should probably focus mostly on the risk instead of focusing on a specific technology. Right before we talked about uh, cybersecurity, IoT, and all those kind of things can have an impact on how we're going to use the technologies. So shouldn't we be focusing on mostly on the risk instead of the way we are using AI? Okay. Farzad, thank you very yeah. much for that first reaction. Uh, now we have our last SME, uh, Istvan, uh, again in the medical space, which is already a challenging, very interesting one uh, for, for, for reasons even before we get to AI. Uh, in, in your specific case, you look at one of the most meritorious applications of AI, which is, you know, curing cancer, uh, right? A and you clearly, you're in the space of medical software, and, and using AI to find therapies that are um, specific to uh, and individualized uh, for, each, for each patient. And one of the challenges 
one of the reasons that we're doing the AI Act is to generate more trust. Okay, there's this uh, this basic fact that you know there's a lot of you know lack of trust in technology, and this limits uptake of new innovations. That that's why we need uh, regulation to an extent. Um, in your experience so far, having to deal with one of the most skeptical audiences out there, oncologists, doctors, how have you uh, managed, you know, how have you sold your product? How have you generated trust in, 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 in software and, and its ability to generate clinical decisions? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, thank you for having me in this panel. And so I can talk about how we can use AI in in oncology and um, the battle against cancer, which is becoming the uh, number one cause of death uh, in Europe and most of the world. So this is the last frontier humanity can overcome. And um, um, in cancer research also, it's like in any, any other areas of uh, science that are, um, the development is not continuous, but you have big leaps. So that was the first when we invented the microscope and then uh, and in 2008, we actually had the, the breakthrough diagnostic uh, uh, method, next generation sequencing. So now we could look at into the uh, genetic cause of cancer and generate a lot of data. Uh, we, can, we can now use to make uh, treatment decisions and find uh, the right uh, targets for targeted therapies. And uh, so in 2010, I was very optimistic that for each cancer therapy, we'll, we will have uh, a companion diagnostic test which help, will help us to decide which patient will benefit from the drug. But, but then in the past um, now um, uh, 12 years, we realized that cancer is more complicated than then. And now we know that we have 700 cancer genes and 6 million mutations. And so therefore, uh, and also each patient has a combination. of So therefore, uh, oncologists is now forced to make decisions on a high level of uncertainty. And now we have data which shows that if the uh, oncologists want to make a personalized treatment decision based on this complex molecular profile, it takes weeks and, um, and, and the uh, decisions are very subjective, not reproducible. Uh, so that's the big concern of doctors and oncologists which like to be to make the decisions based on protocols and based on evidence so all our what we do is based on evidence based medicine so we want to make sure that we we suggest the most likely effective therapy for our patients but the problem with personalized medicine that each patient theoretically is an individual so we don't have any uh, experience with that particular type of patient, with that uh, specific combination of molecular artists. So what's the solution? So the, the big excitement about AI and what we try to solve is how to use AI as a medical tool and turn personalized medicine into an evidence-based medicine. So the, the answer to your question at the end is that when we explain to oncologists that now uh, we, they can provide um, a personalized medicine based on evidence because we have a tool which makes decisions reproducible. So, because uh, the cool thing about uh, uh, software is that if it for the same input, it gives the same output. So, the, the, the algorithms within the tool um, uh, can be um, uh, checked for per, uh, their clinical performance. So, so, and we can scale up and we can provide uh, the equal access to, to high quality level uh, personalized medicine all over. So we can um, democratize access to personalized medicine. So when they understand that now we are going back to evidence-based medicine using AI, uh, that creates trust. The other important thing is that when we talk about artificial intelligence, this uh, the first reaction is that we think that this is an uh, attempt to take away the, of the decision of the oncologist. So what we have to explain to them that these new tools are just new tools which expand their abilities to, to make certain treatment decisions and they have to learn the, um, the advantages and the limitations of these tools. But when they understand this is a tool which they, they can implement, we, we even talk about to implement new procedural codes for doctors who use a, an AI-based uh, tool 
to make decisions and make a digital plan for the therapy, uh, for the patient. So, so when they understand this, they and, and this is what we also, as a, uh, 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 in our company, with our tool, provided clinical evidence based on clinical trial data that we can improve treatment decisions published in pe uh, peer-reviewed journals, and we're presenting our data on major medical conferences, so they understand that this is not replacing the current scientific methodology of um, oncology, but it's a new tool. I won't call it a device, because it's a big question how we define this, but for sure, um, if we explain how they work and we provide clinical evidence about the clinical performance of these tools, they, they are happy to adapt and, and they, they will welcome it in, in their clinical practice. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you. Um, uh, let's, having heard from everybody for a first question, let's go to the poll results. And our poll shows a, a very um, you know, optimistic scenario. As a matter of fact, uh, almost uh, over 60% of our audience believe that the AI Act will make it more difficult. Uh, having heard from all our speakers and strictly based on evidence, they believe that the AI Act will make it more difficult for SMEs uh, to be uh, innovative. Um, Kellyanne, our audience is purely based <laughs> of, you know, made up of evil lobbyists from the <laughs> corporate world, so that, that's why probably. But I, I want to ask uh, Axel. I, I, you, I think, you know, we, we've, we, we've heard, you know, there's the, the, lip service paid to the role of SMEs in the European economy everywhere you look, right? Uh, but w w when it looks to legislative proposals, and, and again, putting my uh, evil corporate hat on, um, there's a lot of regulation in Europe, a lot of regulation. And usually, you know, there's a, a small section that talks about SMEs, and there's quite a few exclusions. So Data Act, for example, but also the measures in the Commission's proposal are all about, you know, micro and small enterprises, for example. So if you're above 50 employees, you know, life gets tough immediately, which doesn't really sound good for innovation and expansion. It's not really good incentive. Um, so knowing this and knowing the political dynamics, particularly in the parliament that you described um, earlier, how optimistic are you that we'll have a result that will be you know, manageable and productive in the final uh, regulation? Hmm, that's a tricky one. If um, y you want me to be very open, um, so far let me express it in such a way I still have hope. Um, I can share the concerns um, of the SMEs here. This is surely n totally not the intention <coughs> of the Commission. This is surely not the intention at least also of a European Parliament, but if you're approaching these more ideologically, so you will end up in the consumer right. So, and, and this of course is not um, helpful for the um, dimension to catch up with other regions in the world. Um, part of it, it might be necessary, but um, so we, we put a lot of requirements for the um, AI systems, uh, the AI high-risk systems in place, and we will also put a lot of obligations to the deployer or inventor, um, uh, developer, and so on also in place. But if we can concentrate really on high-risk AI systems, then probably it might be helpful because what we have to answer with these is also how we would deal as a European society with AI high-risk systems and what does this mean. And therefore we need uh, to protect our fundamental rights, we need to protect ethical principles, but we also should have a kind of a, uh, let's say, simple solution for it, that we have to combine mm -hmm. these values with the techniques and um, having also a standard in place where SMEs then easily can implement and also come forward with. Mm -hmm. This practical point of standards at the end might be a very um, important one. And I hope um, that we still have this possibility. 
Um, I'm sharing the concerns um, because I'm, I'm seeing how we are discussing these from time to time. And um, I'm, I get always asked how business might help. And it, it seems for me if there is not a kind of a common outcry throughout the EU in saying what you are doing here is f too far going, and we can't do our business any longer here, then um, probably nothing will change. N nobody will be hurt at the end and so on. And this, um, to find this balance is a duty of the Council, is the duty of the Commission, and it, it should be our duty. But we have a majority in the Parliament who is more approaching this ideologically instead of looking to the um, yeah, f ideas of practical approaches. And, um, so, and, and we have to come to a point at the end where a legislator also show more flexibility. And so far, if I'm looking again to this big sister GDPR, there is totally no flexibility um, on, the, on this legislative level. And so this is destroying hope. Even if we are doing here something wrong, we won't correct it. And this probably we can approach now differently in, in uh, that we are saying, oh, we are doing now here something, putting something in place and we are supervising or serving these. And then we might correct it more speedy than waiting kind of years or whatever. So this would be a kind of an idea to approach these. But um, I still have hope, let me express it <laughs> this way, that we might come to a good product, legislative product at the end. Um, but so far we have a lot of hurdles to discuss. Thank you, Axel, also for staying positive um, throughout. Uh, I know, I know you, you have to go at 5.30 sharp, so feel free to. That's the privilege of, of lawmakers. Uh, <laughs> but uh, please, very, very privileged uh, to have you so long as you can stay. Uh, and Killian, I do owe you a reaction, both to, what, uh, to my initial question, to what Axel just said. And also, uh, I might want to add to that, the, you know, mentioning GDPR. Uh, but but in, in a lot of ways, GDPR and AI Act are very different. GDPR was a legal framework. Uh, there was very little technical components there. Uh, companies had two years uh, to implement, but they had complete flexibility as to the technical and organizational measures that they had to put in place in their specific case. The AI Act will be you know, heavily reliant. Uh, if everything goes well, we're going to have harmonized standards. If things go a little bit slower, the commission may drop common specifications, which we hope will not be the case. Uh, and the original commission proposal companies would still have uh, two years to comply. So that's going to be a different compliance scenario. And once we have the final regulation there, how is the Commission looking at facilitating compliance, working through the system with SMEs so that they are ready? Thanks a lot for the question. And um, let me first stress, I as, I as well have still hope <coughs> I still <laughs> that we'll get to a good act in the end. Um, <coughs> I think what you pointed out is very important. Um, we have a, a different approach, and Axel mentioned this as well to, 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 to the general data protection regulation, because we have presented a product-based regulation. So it's about making the AI as a product trustworthy. That's the key. And this should be translated into standards, and I think undertakings and companies are much better prepared to comply with standards, because that's your daily business. If you, and I think in the medical area, you know this best. If you work there, you have standards practically for everything. And in the future, and you have to do ex under conformity assessment for your product anyway. For the in the future, what will be added is, and just to put a bit things a bit into perspective, you will have clear criteria for the AI part of this product. It will not be a new assessment. It will not be something uh, out of the box, something unknown. It will be the usual ex under conformity assessment, which you do anyway. But now you will have <coughs> clear criteria and then hopefully clear standards for the, for the AI part. And I think the good news for business, and then because I have to, of course, to say something on your uh, poll, is what we hope, is that then the uptake will be easier because you will be able to say, okay, if I use AI, I'm on the safe side. This has been checked as AI and I can use it. 
We could see this, for instance, we, we, we focus a lot of AI in the public sector, for instance. It's an important area to take up innovation. And we could see there was the problem in the Netherlands, which led to the, um, st st the government stepping back. This, of course, is very bad for a technology if this happens. Eh? So you can imagine if you have a technology <coughs> and things go utterly wrong, you can have this once or twice or three times, but then the, de the technology will be uh, destroyed because you will not allow it anymore in sensitive areas. So I think we should see this as well from this approach. If we get the high-risk area right, um, if then the AI is trustworthy, it will facilitate the uptake uh, that will be good for the SME using the AI and the SME producing it. So your question, sorry, I was too long, but I, I got passionate. Um, yes, of course, we will try to use the time best to prepare. We will set up a network of, of support. What we're planning is um, we will roll out, as you know, uh, digital innovation hubs all over Europe, and there will be at least one specialized on AI in each member state. There may as well be several. These should be the contact points. So the SMEs should be able to go there to understand, to uh, get contact to finance, to mm -hmm. get contact to, uh, to a network, to get uh, access to a technology, but as well to learn about sandboxes, for instance, or how they can get help. We will use uh, the testing and experimentation facilities to think about whether we should set up union testing facilities so that you find as well test places because this can as well be a complex issue for you <coughs> so that there will be facilities how you can and where you can, you can test. So that's another thing we will do. And then of course we will use our training programs together with the member states and try to find clear info points because one thing we always learn from SMEs is that it's very important to get information and to have one point where, which you can address because often it's felt that it's the landscape, there is a lot of things, but it's complicated. You need kind of an advisor or a consultant to find the ideal person who can help you. So to simplify this, this will be, I think, another concern of ours to, to make sure that SMEs are there. Because, and just to end, end we know that in contrast to other parts in the world, in Europe, a lot of AI is developed by small companies and by startups. So we need to get them on board. If we don't manage to get them on board, we will really have a negative impact on innovation. Thank you, Killian. Um, Sorrel, uh, you, you just heard part of what Killian said is that theoretically it should be easier this time around compared to GDPR because you know this is going to be about standards, which is what companies are more familiar with um, in terms of compliance already. So does that sound like a good, convincing value proposition for you? And, and also, more broadly, in terms of supporting measures, you know, what, what do you need from, from governments so that maybe in addition to the AI Act, uh, you have uh, you know, a, good, a good environment from a regulatory perspective that can support your company, but more generally, AI innovation in Europe? Mm -hmm. Killian's idea sounds promising, even though the ideal would be to definitely uh, state some exceptions for SMEs, uh, talking about the AI regulation, because it takes, uh, for a startup, for example, it takes so much time and energy to get out, to get your product out there already. And if you have to invest that time in meeting the expectations of the regulation, uh, you'll never get to anything concrete. And it's also important, it's important to follow the regulations, but it's also important to put your product out there so that people should know what you're doing. And then, uh, then, then we're gonna apply the, all the regulations. Small enterprises need um, support to, to grow and, uh, and then they will follow all the regulations. It's very important for the governments to trust like Cecilia was saying, trust is something you just you just trust because it's 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 a matter of confidence. You trust each other. If there is trust, then we can just evolve together. Uh, talking about road infrastructure, for example, at the moment the governments are negotiating with the road consultants in which road to repair in Europe. In, in general, it's very important for them to consider AI safe and reliable solutions. AI solutions first, AI road solutions, because AI is really, really crucial right now. We need it, it's helping a lot, and uh, we are all working on uh, s uh, safe cyberspace, and like Cecilia was saying before, and as you were saying just right now, uh, all the hubs that you are implementing and everything, it's what Cecilia was calling investing in skills. Uh, um, AI standard skills, uh, cybersecurity skills, 
implementing all those areas or high, very high school, very good schools for our kids to attend easily with an easy access to those schools to be able to protect our cyberspace in the future. So IV Technologies, for example, is uh, one of the most rel reliable uh, AI solution out there because I'm talking here for all the SMEs. Uh, IV is a very low risk one, but I'm talking in general. Uh, we are here in this panel with the voices of, of everybody. So we need to get more trust from you. Thank you, Sorel. I'm going to check quickly with the audience. In case you have any questions, now's the time to raise your hand. Uh, you'll get a microphone, uh, I'm sure. Uh, if not, I'll go to Farzad. Um, and uh, when, it, when it comes to one of the interesting questions for industry is uh, cost. Uh, how, how much will it cost to comply uh, with the AI Act? Uh, and there's a number of proxies for that. Skillian said uh, the framework is based on product regulation. So we have a few examples there. Uh, and you are, are in the medtech space. So in that specific case, you have the medical device regulations. Um, and what, what has been your experience there? And, and how, how, how worried are you about more costs than you're already incurring for complying with that very uh, broad framework already? Well, thank you for the question. Um, as you mentioned, we have a class 2B product and uh, uh, starting by having the MDR has been actually quite expensive for us. We also talk about having more tests and every time we have talk about tests, it means it's going to cost more. And, and again, we talk at the number of notified bodies, it's difficult for us to get a budget for how much it costs to approve our products because there is no competition when you're talking about uh, notified bodies. So by adding more uh, uh, requirements, it definitely is going to cost more for us. But I'm supporting AI Act, it's a good idea, but we are talking about a lot of new uh, small companies. And by having this regulation, we are also, the product is going to cost more. And just for information, there are about 30, 33,000 medical device companies in Europe, and more than 90% of them, they have less than 50 employees. So by having those regulations requirements, we are just adding more cost to those companies. And it definitely have a, a effect impact on the innovation. Thank you for that. I'm, and and uh, to Istvan, I'm, I'm going to ask a similar question. And you already you know, expanded quite a lot on you know, the spectrum of things that you have to deal with in a medical environment, because it's, you know, it's, it's about people and regulations. And there's a number of them, a number of stakeholders already in the healthcare system, a number of regulations at various levels in the healthcare system. So when you, when you look at your specific case uh, and, and how, how difficult would an additional layer of legislation uh, be uh, when it comes to putting those solutions um, uh, in, you know, in, in place. Um, and, you know, how do you see particularly, you know, the, the overlap with the, the laws that you already have to deal with? You know, do you see an opportunity that this would fix something or do you only see the negative at this point? Yes, thank you. So uh, the positive thing, I agree that it, uh, I hope it will increase trust in, in users and, uh, and also in doctors and also the fact that we talk about AI is a great thing to, to, to tell people that it's going to come and it will play an extremely important part in our life and also in it will be part of our solutions against the diseases. So that's the positive, absolutely. Uh, and yes, uh, 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 the healthcare sector is in a very special situation because we also have the Medical Device Regulation Act. We have to comply with and And yes, it would be extremely important to, to weed out any op overlaps and to make sure that uh, um, who we can opt out from certain compliance if it's already covered, if we comply within, with another law with the MDR. So we should avoid any uh, extra administration burden and, and cost. So that would be great because MDR in, in Europe is already uh, extremely um, um, 
uh, provides a very high level of regulations. For example, just an example that in our field, uh, decision support systems in the uh, uh, US are exempt from uh, device regulation. But according to MDR, even a decision support system has become uh, a medical device, a class two. Uh, which is, so which means that we have to provide evidence that actually is provide benefit for the patients. Uh, even a tool which gives information to the doctor, he should know. So, so it's an extremely high level of regulation already according to MDR. And uh, so, so, so that, that this is the only reason I'm not afraid of uh, <laughs> AI Act, because I'm sure that if we can comply to the MDR, it shouldn't be difficult to also comply at the same time to the AI Act. But uh, for sure, we have to avoid any duplications in these two uh, regulations. That would be great. Very good. OK, a note of hope again from ISTVAC. Th this is a very interesting panel. These are all very interesting panels, but we only have 45 minutes. So I think that's it. That's all we have time for. Uh, we do have one question, perhaps. Oh, that's <laughs> great. I'm more than glad to extend the panel. And the mic is coming. There you go. Can I just maybe ask you to stand sure. up oh my uh, God, and this introduce <laughs> yourself officially oh for the God. question? Oh, my God. Hi, Elizabeth Crossick from Relics, a new member of Digital Europe. Um, I just wanted to kind of go on to maybe a bit more practical um, question, actually, for Killian and for Axel, but also for others about the regulatory sandboxes. So this is an, this is an opportunity for companies, for SMEs to explore. And, and at the moment, they're quite narrow in how they would be used. And so I was wondering whether we could have more of a kind of what we, we call a two-way learning approach, whereby uh, you could expand it to kind of where interpretation or application uh, is tested and potentially changes might be made as a result of that testing to show that it's in the benefit of humankind. So therefore, maybe you, you, um, you use secondary legislation or whatever to open it up a little bit. And I do know, I noted here that um, Singapore did a similar thing for the GDPR. I know it's different, but um, they actually have a sandbox which they use to test possible changes to the Data Protection Act. So the idea is because the AI Act, however future-proof it is, is always going to be set in time. Using the regulatory sandboxes, expanding them so that you can experiment with things that are maybe slightly outside or slightly beyond, and then go back and, and use that as an opportunity to open it back up and at secondary level might be an opportunity to use learnings to improve the process as it goes on. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I'm trying to summarize very quickly. It does. OK, who wants to take this? Killian, you have to take this one. Thanks. Uh, no, thanks for the good question. <coughs> Indeed, I mean, there is a lot of interest in these sandboxes. We see this. And sandboxes, uh, we, have, we start to have a bit of experience. We, have, we developed them mainly in the financial sector, but they're now used in other sectors as well. What we have proposed originally was mainly a regulatory sandbox. So meaning, <coughs> and that's why I mentioned as well the hubs, because the hubs should then be the place or the testing experimentation facilities where you try. The sandbox would mainly be there to help you to overcome this regulatory challenge, which may be difficult for you as, an, as a small company, <coughs> so that you have a, a protected area under the supervision of the uh, national competent authority to try and then to be prepared. Because what we learn is a lot that the small companies may not from the beginning, for instance, document their data set in a way which would then allow them to do the under conformity assessment or to set up a quality management system from the start. So that should really be the key role of the sandbox so that you that you you start with your development, so what you describe that you develop, but you develop it from the beginning in a way which is compliant, so that somebody helps you and gives you a hand, or um, so that you do not have to repeat, for instance, development steps at the end of the process, because, for instance, the documentation which you have um, 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 fulfilled or set up is not sufficient to meet the requirements. So that's a bit the idea, <coughs> so that at, at this, it should be a living, a bit of a living uh, target, and of course, you should pass, you should be able to come back to the sandbox for instance, if you substantially modify your system. So it's not a one-off thing, but you can come back if you have then to, to modify, for instance, uh, substantial changes. That's the, the idea. There you go. And with <coughs> that extension of the panel, I would like to thank all my panelists again for a wonderful discussion. I'm sure there will be a follow-up at another Digital Europe event <laughs> uh, very soon, and the audience as well. And Cecilia, back to you.
Thank you. Why don't we start by giving these uh, five excellent experts a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And instead of looking at uh, for a chair, just just stay here for, for me <laughs> rounding up, if you don't mind, if you're not busy and have to go immediately, because there are drinks afterwards, Axel. Four I minutes. Mean, yeah, <laughs> okay, four minutes drinks. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for our members who made this possible. AVID, the Czech um, Digital Association, Accenture, Johnson Johnson, Microsoft, and United Health Group. Thank you so much for your support in putting the program together. And thank you to all the speakers who actually joined today. For the 600 people who are online watching this, absolutely uh, tremendously fantastic. Most of you stayed all day. And uh, of course, to all of you who are in the room, as I said, there are drinks in a minute. So um, I think we learned a few things. Um, we learned that between 75 and 80 percent of the listeners would share their health data. 80 percent would like to share the health data. And the, the share went up uh, actually with the implementation of the, the new uh, health data space in Europe. Uh, we also learned that 100 percent of the listeners online and in the room uh, would like uh, the countries of Europe to collaborate much closer on cyber and that nearly 100 percent or 80 something wanted EU and NATO to collaborate much uh, much more and that there was a private need for private and public sector collaboration on cyber. Then we also learned that there is actually something called political sandboxing and that this might be needed for the AI Act. How can we actually uh, test if it comes to the benefit of SMEs and maybe even adjust over time, as, uh, as suggested by Elizabeth. Um, I was thinking that maybe one of the things we could do in the next 12 months until the next summer summit is to survey all our SMEs. I think we have around 40,000 uh, SMEs actually as a part of Digital Europe now. Ask them what are the things that you need in your sector to improve your uptake of AI and uh, what can the regulatory uh, environment actually improve to help uh, you on AI. So I know it's in the run up of doing that, but uh, I think it could be one of the things that we could do to actually make sure that we reach the target of the AI Act benefiting the hundreds of thousands of SMEs that are uh, actually also uh, growing in Europe. So many, many other learnings, but there is a time for everything. And now it's time for drinks in the courtyard. Thank you so much for joining today and thank you for joining online. <laughs>